and then the dark custom will sing through it twice. In the springtime, there are four of those appointed times, four of those feasts or festivals, and uh, two Sundays hence, we will take a fairly hard look at them in the morning service. I don't think you'll want to miss it. We will go through them. Let's just see if anybody remembers what they are. The first of those festivals would be Passover, Pesach, if you're uh, into the Hebrew, followed immediately by Unleavened bread, right? And followed immediately by first fruits. First fruits. And then 50 days after first fruits, the final spring feast would be Pentecost, or if you're into the Hebrew, Shavuot. But we'll take a look at that two weeks hence. Then a week after that, we'll take a very hard look at Passover in the morning service. And then, the Friday following that, we'll actually have a Seder service here, which uh, your observant Jewish neighbors would do about a month later. So, uh, now the question you probably immediately would ask is, uh, well, we're not Jewish, so why do we pay attention to that? Well, I'm reminded of uh, a young bishop in the city of Ephesus. His name was Timotheus, and he had been put there by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul told him that from a child you have known the holy scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation. What scriptures were those exactly? The Tanakh, the Old Testament. And uh, Paul's writings are loaded with allusions to the Passover. Remember what he told the Corinthian Christians? Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed. Mm -hmm. And then, let's make sure that you are a pure lump Mm -hmm. with no yeast in it. Now, what was he alluding to there? Mm -hmm. The Passover. As uh, Pastor Dan has walked us through Hebrews, remember an allusion to the blood of bulls and goats? What was the writer of Hebrews talking about then? He was talking about Yom Kippur, the holiest of the high holy days among these 
festivals. Okay. So the point is, we believers in this age have a great deal of reason to look into the festivals of Israel. They point us directly to our Lord. Okay, well, with that, uh, you won't want to miss it. Be sure to be here. A couple other uh, events that uh, we should share together. If you'll grab your bulletin, let's just look them together. Uh, again, tonight, continuation of the end time event series. Then, uh, ladies, preset Bible study, minor prophets on Fridays, 9 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary. Now, March the 16th, a wonderful opportunity for fellowship and service. We have a spring work day. And uh, we guarantee you will not work you too hard, but you'll enjoy it. So come if you can. March the 16th. That's a Saturday, by the way. We talked about the Seder service already. And uh, don't forget, uh, Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School, still a couple months away, but it's not too early to be thinking about it. Now, are there any other announcements that uh, uh, haven't been mentioned that uh, we need to share with each other? Now's a chance. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful again for the tremendous truths that you present to us from your word. And we're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity you've given us even today to gather together, to fellowship together, and to fellowship around your word. Now, Lord, we would pray that this morning your Holy Spirit would be our guide, would be our mentor, would be our teacher. We pray, Lord, that he would open hearts, that he would open minds, that we would, Lord, be willing and able and desirous of hearing what you would uh, tell us. We do pray that everything we do might please you in our worship. We pray that uh, the singing, the prayer, the giving, and the ministry of the word would bring pleasure to your heart. Mm -hmm. And we ask, Lord, that as we meet together today in koinonia, in fellowship, that you would enable us to see you more clearly and to obey you more consistently. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, let me say good morning to you as well. It's great to have a number of visitor, uh, visitors with us today. And we also have the Gibbs family with us today. Adam is uh, director of uh, ministries at Now Ministries, and I'm going to let him tell you all about that. But we'll have him come at this time. Glad to have him and his family here uh, today. Appreciate it. Well, it is wonderful to be with you here, and we do thank you for this opportunity to take a few moments just to share about what God has us doing and the ministry he's placed us in. Uh, my wife is here, and then my Bethany, and then my oldest daughter, Michaela, then Colette, middle daughter, Carson is back with the children, uh, and then Colette also has our service, her service dog, Opal, who's down there, uh, who is hiding like she's supposed to be, nice and quiet. But we're glad to be here, share a bit about our ministry. As Pastor said, I'm the general director of Nationals Outreach Worldwide Ministries, or NOW Ministries. And as the name says, our focus is accomplishing the Great Commission by training, equipping, and supporting the national pastors. Over 20 years ago, probably 25, 27 years ago, in 1997, our founder and president, Evangelist True Marshall, had the opportunity to visit Cuba. And God just opened the doors. He was able to go down there and spend some time with the pastors and workers in Cuba and became burdened of just simply helping them in any way he could. Uh, if you are an ordained minister in Cuba and you're pastoring a church, you cannot hold a legal job. It's very difficult for you. Of course, the resources are very limited as well. And so God stirred in his heart to begin to try and just take some support down to them. So he started doing that, and then it began to grow from there. Uh, eventually, we had a seminary started there that's now been going well over 20 years with over 1,300 who have graduated and gone out starting churches, planting churches. Uh, but then as that ministry grew, we began to get contact with those others around the world uh, through other American missionaries or Western missionaries who had contacts or had perhaps had some nationals that were trained and said they just need some help. Would you be able to do that? And so we began to partner with them, come alongside them. And now our ministry has grown. We work in about 45 countries with a thousand different national pastors and workers around the world. And uh, many of those places are closed to Westerners on a sustained basis, places like Myanmar or Cuba uh, or uh, Venezuela 
uh, or many other places, Laos and things like that. And God is just using them and using this ministry to see souls saved, churches planted uh, uh, around this world, and we're excited to be part of that this ministry. Uh, and so my role as a general director is I travel to these places. I spend a couple weeks here and there with the pastors, with the Baba colleges, uh, holding conferences, encouraging them, training them, coming alongside them for larger evangelistic outreaches as we go into new places to see new churches started, and can just encouraging them, helping them, supporting them in any way that we can, giving them the tools and resources uh, so that they can do the work and ministry that they need to do. Paul says you teach others to teach others also. And that is what I do. And that is what we do. And that is our focus and heartbeat there. And we're seeing God do some incredible things. The video in just a few moments is going to share you a bit of the results of what God is doing and how you can help with that. Uh, but that is our ministry. That is what we do. We're excited about what God is doing and that we're looking forward to where he has us as we continue on. Uh, at the table, there's some inf more information about the ministry, just some general information, a bit more about what we do. Uh, and then there is a newsletter back there that kind of talks about our most recent, uh, if you want to say campaign or ministry over in Asia. We did a couple weeks in Cambodia and in the Philippines and kind of just some reports and some, uh, some articles about that I've written, our president through Marsh has written, the pastor that went with me when we did the pastor's conference, leadership conference. So it kind of gives you an idea more of what we do when we go uh, and what God does and how he uses us there. And so, and, and, and so I, grab, I encourage you, grab one of those, take some time to read it. It'll introduce you to more about, okay, what do they do when they go on these trips? Well, this is what we do. Uh, we go out and we, you know, we'll have a pastor's conference or and when I go to Malawi here in July, it'll be more of a national conference. I'll be visiting six regions, spending time with different churches in that area. And the people who come in, we'll spend some time encouraging them, do some discipleship work, encouraging them as well as organizing a new Bible college that we're looking at starting in Malawi and Blantyre. Uh, as God is, the Malawi work is just doing incredible, God is just doing some incredible things. And the video tell a bit more about that as well, what God is doing there. They're reaching into Mozambique now. Uh, and so uh, when you can come behind these guys, come alongside of them, partner with them, give them the tools and resources that we have a plethora of here, they can take it and do far greater things than any of us could even imagine. And so that is what we do. That is our focus. And God is blessing it. And we're seeing him doing some incredible, incredible things. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to show the video now. And then, Pastor, from there, you can take it as you're continuing your service there. But if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to connect with us. We're glad to answer them. And as I said, there's prayer cards. There's more information there. Uh, but we thank you for this opportunity to come and share a little bit about what God is doing and what he has us doing. Now ministry is an incredibly multifaceted ministry that is truly making a difference around the world. At our core, we are dedicated to the spreading of the gospel and establishing of churches under the leadership of local nationals in various countries. And the impact these nationals are having is truly remarkable. So for example, in Cuba, a nation that is closed off to U.S. missionaries, we have seen over a thousand individuals trained in the seminary and hundreds of churches planted across the island. And this is all under national leadership. In Myanmar, which is closed off from a sustainable Western missionary presence, we have invested in a structured ministry to bring the gospel to the people. Through the Nationals' efforts, churches are being established in previously unreached areas, and the Bible is being translated into local dialects for the first time. And all this progress is happening under the faithful leadership of Nationals. Even in Malawi, a nation that was once labeled as the poorest in Africa, we have played a vital role in developing a thriving National leadership. Through extensive training, equipping, and supporting, we have seen Nationals go out and plant churches across the country. And these nationals are even extending their reach into the neighboring Mozambique to spread the gospel and establish churches. This ministry is truly making a remarkable difference in the world. The gospel is reaching into areas that were once considered closed, and churches are being established under the guidance of well-trained leaders who adhere to sound doctrine. With continued support and investment, we can ensure that these stories of success continue. 
So I ask you to consider supporting my family as we oversee the training and equipping of current and future national Christian workers. Together, we can contribute to the establishment and growth of strong national-led churches. Furthermore, your support towards the overall ministry of NOW Ministries would greatly assist in alleviating the administrative burden that comes with such a vast organization. Your contribution will enable churches and individuals like yourself to play an active part in these impactful ministries around the globe. Lastly, I kindly ask you to consider supporting the national church planters as they courageously venture into unreached areas, spreading the gospel and establishing churches among their own people. You know, together, we can have the power to make a true and lasting difference. The gospel will reach even to the furthest corners of the world, and local indigenous churches will be firmly established. Will you join with us in this noble cause? Thank you for that. It's great to hear about that ministry and how the church is uh, thriving around the world. Sometimes I think we have a tendency to forget that there are people meeting all around of many other uh, languages and cultures, and it's so great to, to know that. 682 is next, Wings as Eagles. <laughs> scriptures, and uh, if you'll grab either your scripture or follow along on the uh, screens to the front, we will be looking at Psalm chapter 34, and uh, you read silently while I read out loud. Psalm 34, starting at verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. 
Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. And now, if I might, let me ask uh, the men to come forward to uh, receive the offering. And uh, just a reminder, this is as important a part of worship as any other. Brother Chris, could you uh, come to the Lord for us? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together and work with you, join together as Christians, to be with Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give, and we pray that you would help us to give generously, and that you would help us to give cheerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. for that rousing arrangement of Send the Light, the Blessed Gospel Light. What a privilege it is to do that and to be involved with that work. We've been singing songs about God's guidance and care this morning. The next one is found on page 170, By the Gentle Waters. Please stand with me. Thank you. 
singing today. You may be seated. Take your Bibles, please, and find Hebrews chapter 12. We continue our study. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me mention one more date for you to keep in mind. That's March 17th after the morning service. Just a couple weeks away, we will have a VBS meeting for uh, all those who I've already um, roped and tied and uh, have bound up waiting. Uh, no, I'm teasing about that. It's a joy. And uh, let me encourage those of you who are not uh, involved, uh, if you're interested at all, show up at that meeting. We'll have that meeting um, following the morning service, March 17th, in a couple weeks. And so let me encourage you. Uh, we can always use help in a, ver a variety of places with VBS. So uh, we'll make more announcements about that as we get later on. All right, Hebrews chapter 12. It's great to have a number of you visiting with us, and I thank you again for being a part of our services today, and I uh, hope I can get to meet you uh, following the service. And if you've not met our, our friends, the Gibbs, then uh, make sure you see them before uh, they head on this afternoon. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, let's uh, continue our study in the book of Hebrews. We'll be beginning reading at verse 11, and we'll continue reading through verse 17. And look at this passage of Scripture, which we began a week ago uh, with the instruction and the training and the discipline that is necessary in the life of a believer, just like on a, an earthly level, a father and mother teaches and trains and disciplines their children so God has a purpose and a plan for what He allows uh, to come into our lives. And we are not to uh, think lightly of that. We are not to become discouraged in it. Uh, we are to allow it to uh, exercise in us the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And the key word there is found in verse number 11, those who have been trained by it. We found this word a number of months ago as we came through Hebrews chapter 6, that those who are mature and uh, are those who have exercised themselves, have trained themselves in the ways of the things of God. So uh, that's where we are picking up in the middle of this passage with the word therefore in chapter 12, but we'll, or excuse me, chapter 12 and verse 12, but we'll begin reading in verse number 11. So you follow along as we begin. Hebrews 12, verse 11 for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. 
but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This is our passage of Scripture for this morning, so let's ask God's help as we look at it. Our Father, we are grateful that we can come together and sing praise to you. We thank you that you are our shelter, you are our rock, our mighty tower, you are our fortress, you're the one that we run to, and in your arms we are safe forevermore. Lord, we thank you for that, and we praise you for the privilege of knowing you, of being called your sons and your daughters. We thank you for all that we have In Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And Father, you've called each of us to a race. And you've set a specific path before each one of us. I pray that you would help us to take seriously the race that we are to run. And that in these verses we may find encouragement and comfort and help in running the race that we have each day. So we pray for your power, we pray for your strength, we pray for your spirit to do a work in our hearts, we pray for your word to be effective and powerful and living and operative as it is. We know that your word will not return void or empty without accomplishing the work that you intend it to do. So Father, I pray that you would do a work in each heart today. That you'd teach us what we need to know. That you'd make us to be, become all that you'd have us to be. Help us to see what you have for us today. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we work through this passage of Scripture, we really are coming to the end. We're coming to the end of Hebrews. In fact, I can say with this passage of Scripture, we are at the end because... As we work through this uh, lengthy book, very detailed book, it has been a wonderful study. I've enjoyed every bit of it. And we've come to the point where it's the the now what. We've established the what early on, and then we've looked at the so what's. Well, this is the now what. what. What does this mean for us in our daily lives? And for the last chapter or so, chapter and a half, we have been a challenge to the endurance and the patient running the race that God has set before us. We need to endure under the, the, stri- the trials and the struggles of the Christian life. And we uh, have likened this race that each one of us has to a, a distance race, not a sprint, not a quick race that can be over and accomplished in one or two years of our living, and then we can move on to other goals and other ambitions and other things. This is a lifelong race. This is a marathon, to be sure. The other illustration that we've used is the illustration of an obstacle course. It's not a flat track where you just run without any hindrances or any obstacles. This is a full-blown obstacle course because we have enemies, the world, We have our flesh and the evil one who would love to trip us up and to cause us to stumble in the race that God has given to us. To share an illustration with you, I go back many years to the days of working at camp with teenagers. We had an obstacle course built on the property of our campground. And it had all the, the classic, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the mud pit. You had to swing over with a rope. You had the monkey bars, 
the wall, the over, the through, and the under. Now, there were a number of tires and, and hoops and things that you had to run around that were there to trip them up and to slow them down. Of course, the fastest time would win. One particular weekend uh, before our Monday running of this obstacle course, we had a storm blow through and there was a massive tree that blew down uh, across the entrance to the trail. It was right at the entrance to this obstacle course. And so uh, we had the map there for everyone to see how the obstacle course would go. But right there in the opening of the trail, you could see this giant tree log across the trail. We did not have the time to take and to cut it up and to move it out of the way because of its size. So we simply added to our routine, ready, set, watch out for the tree, and go. And we tried to tell everyone that this is a new addition. You know, some of the old veterans who had been there for years and had knew the course, you know, they were some of the faster times. And we told them, ready, set, watch out for the tree, and go. And most of them stumbled over that tree. It was just baffling because you could see it, we reminded them just before we let them go and turn them loose that there was an obstacle there and they still tripped up on it. Now, last week we saw the importance of discipline in the life of a believer. Yes, from dad and mom, that should be part of a, a young child's training and rearing. But in the life of a believer, we have a loving father who is not just going to give us a life of ease, nor is just going to let us go. He has called us to the race. Christ, our captain, we are to look to him and follow the race that God has set for us. But if you think that this author of Hebrews is going to give us a challenge in the race and not warn us about obstacles, you would be wrong. And that's what brings us to these last Two portions of Scripture, the remainder of 12 and chapter 13, give to us a number of obstacles that are there in life that will trip us up, cause us to stumble, to lose our focus, to lose our way in the race of life. I'm reminded of a Curious George uh, cartoon years ago, watching with my, my, my not-so-little boys now. But in this particular episode of Curious George, he was introduced uh, from playing basketball where the high score wins to the game of miniature golf. And so he was just having fun. And at the end, they tallied up the scores. And the girl, she got like a 37. And the guy got a 54. And when they came to Curious George, and they said that his score was 255, his eyes lit up. And he was jumping up and down because he had thought that he won the, the game of golf. And then they had to explain to him that it's not like basketball, where the high score wins. This is a different game. And the low score wins. And what he said was it's a lot harder to get a low score in golf than a high score. As we try to run the race that God has set before us, it doesn't take very long before we realize it's not an easy race. Life is challenging. And God is sovereign. And God does allow these things to enter into the course of our race. But they are for our good. They are to strengthen us and to cause us to be prepared to continue in the race as we begin this passage of Scripture in verse number 12, we find the therefore, which is linking these comments and these commands to the training that brings righteousness. And we need to be trained in righteousness. Uh, th this word trained is the same word we found back in chapter 6 about exercising. It's, it is not just uh, knowing about a... Um, a task. For example, my wife teaches piano, and she has uh, the one-on-one -on -one instruction where she actually observes them playing the piano and performing the pieces that she had given them assignments. And then at the end of the classroom, she'll take a notebook that she's purchased for them that is their assignment book, 
and she will write down a number of things to work on. And she often comments that it is very obvious those who take the book and go home and never open it until the next Wednesday when they come back, and those that actually open the book and to see that she has told them to work on lifting their hands and emphasizing the melody notes and work on your technique and your timing and those things. <clears throat> Instruments, professional job, sports, athletics, whatever it is that we set ourselves to demands discipline, demands training, and the Christian life is no different. And so we are called to be trained by these. Well, these are some things. Verse number 12, you see there, Therefore lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet. Now in this last passage of Scripture, he highlighted Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, and used that Old Testament passage of Scripture to drive his instruction uh, for us then. It, it is almost now that he is turning to Isaiah and to Job, different passages of Scripture to remind us that if we are running a race, the way that we keep going in the race is sometimes simply a matter of lifting up your knees. One leg in front of the other. Keep your hands up. Having a mindset that is determined and focused on finishing the race. It is so easy to start to want to give up when the race becomes difficult. And he's challenging these believers. Whether the, the difficulties in their life are from just instruction, whether this is a training element that God is repeatedly putting them through to teach them, or whether this is a disciplinary matter, a matter of correction, all three, I think, can be demonstrated from this passage of Scripture that at different times and at different one's lives here in this uh, community of believers, that God is dealing with different people. Some instructing, some training, some correcting. But in all of it, don't become discouraged. Keep your eyes on Jesus who finished his race and run the race that is set before you. Isaiah 35, 3 says this, Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Job 4, 3 and 4, Behold, you have instructed many and you have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. And so we need to have the proper mindset that this is for our good. It is for our good. Notice verse number 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We're reminded here that we are in this race. Uh, each one runs the race. We run our own race, but we're surrounded by others who are running the race with us. And rather than having a me-only mentality, I think the author here is challenging us to look around us and make sure that, uh, to use the phrase, no one is left behind that we ensure that others finish. And I can show you this. If you notice verse number 15, it says, see to it. Now, this is interesting because in our English uh, translation, we would miss this. See to it. We would just think that that is another way of saying, okay, here's a, a task on the checklist. Make sure that it is done. But this phrase, see to it, comes from the word that we get our word oversight or bishop from. In other words, there's a responsibility here, not only to ourselves as individuals, but to others around us. When he says, see to it, he's not just saying, you see to yourself that you accomplish these things. But he's also saying you have a responsibility to the person next to you to see to it that they also accomplish the race that they have before them. It's a matter of holiness. I'm reminded of Timothy chapter 2 in which we're told God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his 
And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This matter of seeking peace with others is what God has called us to do. Blessed are the peacemakers. It's not just you try to live at peace with others, but make peace. Be one who is proactive. Be one who is working to create a peaceful environment. You know, if we ever understand sports analogies, this is one that that a a conflict within a team can destroy national championship hopes, world championship dreams. You let a little bit of of, of fighting or a little bit of um, at one another within a team, and it can derail because it robs the whole team of their focus and their drive, and it takes the energy that should be focused on the enemy or the opposing team And it's spent and wasted in hassling with one another. We are called to live at peace with all men. Not only the household of faith as well. And we're to strive for holiness. You know, God has made us holy in Christ Jesus. This is a wonderful truth. This is the only... This is the only explanation as to how you and I could have fellowship with God and to be called His Son and to be able to escape His righteous wrath and judgment is that He has transformed us, that He has changed us, that in Christ we wear the garment that Christ obtained that is a pure and perfect garment. And we do that because Christ Himself took our garment of sin and stain and bore the punishment in our place. He suffered for us so that we could be called sons of God, holy and righteous, and that we are. But a reminder here that throughout the Scriptures, holiness, yes, we are, but we're also reminded that it is part of our responsibility to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling that we have in Christ Jesus, that we are to put away that which is dishonorable, that we are to live lives that are clean and pure. Peter reminds us that as God is holy, so we too are to be holy, that is, in all of our manner and living. And so we're reminded there that we are to um, strive for peace and holiness. These are things that can trip us up. Certainly in the matter of holiness, and he'll specifically go to, especially chapter 13, but here uh, for too long in chapter 12, he'll give us some instruction there. Verse number 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. He wants us to notice the contagious and the corrupting nature of bitterness. Now, if we're not careful, it is along the journey of life that we can become bitter. At life, at circumstances, and sometimes, yes, even toward God. Why have you allowed this to happen? Why have others seen victory in chapter 11 of Hebrews and yet my head was cut off? Why was I tortured? Why was I persecuted? Why have I wandered around with nothing? Well, look, folks, I'm not here to give you the answer as far as why because that is in the mind of God. He has a perfect plan, the plan for your good and for His glory. And one day, if you stay under and you be exercised and trained 
in the things that God wants to. It's like the potter and the clay. Maybe uncomfortable, he'd put in pressure and shaping, but at the end of the day, it's a beautiful vessel that God has created with his own hands, your life and mine. We have to keep the right mindset and the right perspective and avoid becoming bitter in life's circumstances, but to remind ourselves that it is all for our good. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, here's a passage of Scripture. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This was a couple chapters ago in chapter 10, but we come to that again when we have this three times see to it, not only regarding yourselves, but those around you. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. This is a challenge that you and I are to not only look at ourselves, and to make sure that daily we understand the grace of God. And because of Christ, we get in on it. Don't leave it as an option that you never partook in. Now, we know that there are God's graces. Life itself is a grace of God. But there's so much more through the word of God and through prayer and through our great high priest who is at the right hand of God, who is there to make intercession for us. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. That's what it means to make sure that we, not, we do not fail the grace of God. That we go to God and we tell Him, I want everything you have for me today. What you set in my path as my course to run today. Give me the strength and give me the stamina and give me the focus and the outlook to keep my eyes on to you and to keep just running the race, lifting the knees, raising the hands, keeping focus on Christ, running the race. We're running to win. That's the goal here of running to win. One more he mentions here, verse number 16, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. We know that Jacob deceived Esau and was participant in the events of his life. But make no mistake about it, the scriptures bring us to the point where Esau clearly made a decision to sell out a future of blessing, a lifetime of blessing for one meal. For one meal. The eternal for the temporary. I think nowhere is this more evident than when it comes to sexual immorality. I want to just to pause here in our, our final moments and look at this passage seriously. When he when he talks about the sexual immorality and can, compares it to Esau, I want us to understand the importance of what he's saying here. That a lifetime of blessing can be forfeited for a moment of pleasure. In dealing with, with men and dealing with teenagers and, and getting, you know, asking pastoral counsel about the issues of sexuality and pornography and all that is just bombarding us every day today, um, I always challenge the individual to read first, that's step one, and meditate on, that's two, and if possible, memorize Proverbs 5, 6, and seven. It is one of the most packed, brief portions of Scripture 
that gives to it. I, I, one day we will. If we come back to this later on, maybe we will spend a number of weeks on this. But I want you just to get a flavor of what he challenges here in Proverbs 6. This is a father writing to his son about the women that the Bible calls the strange or the foreign woman, the, the adulteress, the, the women who are out to destroy lives. Proverbs 6. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Well, we understand the answer to that is no. So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious, and he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though you multiply gifts. Chapter 7, we skip over, same context. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. Chapter 5 warns again. He says, look, God has given to us a beautiful, holy institution called marriage. You to rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her love intoxicate you all the days of your life. Be satisfied with the one that God has given to you. But know this, that your responsibility in regards to sexuality is not just a temporary decision. It has a lifetime of lasting effects. And it will trip us up. We, we all know we could round out the hour this morning by telling of individuals who were running well and they took their eyes off of Jesus and put them on another individual. And the warning here is very clear. Make sure to it that you and others around you are not sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. It reminds us, verse 17, for you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no uh, chance to repent, though he sought it with, cure, with, with tears. I think the idea here of the, the, the translation does not make it clear that, that there was no remorse or repentance. He obviously knew what he had done. And he sought to reverse it. But just like with the birthright, you recall we studied this a number of months ago in a separate study. As he went to the father and, and begged, give me, don't you have something for me? There was another blessing. There was a separate blessing. But the initial blessing, the initial birthright was already given. It could not be reverse. And I think that's the warning he's giving here. You, you've got to understand, once you bite, 
the hook, you're caught. And at that point, you're on for the ride. Well, he'll continue this in chapter 13 with more uh, instructions and more warnings about what these obstacles are. Next time together, we look at an illustration from the Old Testament to help us understand um, really the, the, uh, the, the situation that we have, the privileged position that we now have versus those under the Old Covenant. So may God help us to take these things to heart, to be on the lookout for the obstacles that our own flesh sets before us each day, that our neighbors in this world, and it's all of its secular and uh, immoral uh, push, is putting in front of us. Uh, certainly we know that there is an evil one. And our prayer ought to be, as, as Matthew 6 reminds us, that God would deliver us each day from the evil one to give us the strength to stand. And having done, uh, having done all to stand, may God help us to do so. Father, thank you again for the word this morning and the instruction of warning that we can have disunity, strife, division, bitterness, disappointment that would rob us of our faith and our walk, of profane and unholy and immoral actions. Father, help us daily to seek your power and your strength to live with clean hands and a pure heart. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. As pastor was preaching this morning, I couldn't help but thinking of John Newton, whose life demonstrated how there can be great, serious consequences of going your own way, but also how God forgives and restores and uh, can give a person a full life when they do obey and come back to him. So let's sing his song of testimony, Amazing Grace, found on page 130 together. We're going to try to sing this at a comfortable pace, neither rush nor too slow. When we get to verse 4, I'm going to have Karen give us light piano support. And then in verse 5, we'll use just our voices to sing this together. Please stand. <laughs> this morning.
morning. Have a wonderful afternoon.